Uh, I'm Steve Thomas. Uh, you may know me as Scoops. Uh, I've been doing this, well, I've been researching cryptography for like 12 years. More actively for the last five. Uh, so, advancements in time memory trade offs is my speech. Uh, so, time memory trade offs, you have brute force, which is like the category. The category. The category? Category of uh, like brute force, dictionary, Markov, etc. Uh, basically, you uh, come up with a password somehow, hash it, and then check it against your hash that you're trying to crack. Then hash tables, uh, same exact things that except for you store the uh, all the, all the work that you do. Uh, this is all done before uh, you start actually trying to crack anything. Uh, then when you want to actually use this, you have your hash, then you just look it up in the table and then tell you your password. Uh, chain tables. This is uh, rainbow tables, helmet tables, distinguish points, combinations of those. Uh, I'm not actually going to be talking about brute force. Uh, there's been a lot of talks. There's uh, Hashcat, Crypto, uh, Multi-Forcer, uh, uh, John the Ripper, all those others. So, uh, first, we're going to be minimizing memory usage. Uh, there are two algorithms: uh, minimal perfect hash functions. Uh, basically, this is a hash table data structure where uh, perfect means that there are no collisions. So, basically, you're given all the data up front. Then you have to generate this hash function such that it maps into the hash table without any collisions. Uh, the minimal means that there are no empty slots. Uh, the current best algorithm is compressed hash and displace. Uh, it was invented in 2009. I'm bad with fans, so I it was. Uh, then there is Elias Fano encoding. Um, this was invented in around 1970. Uh, and then I reinvented it because I didn't find it, which would save me a lot of time. Uh, basically, it's for uh, sorted lists of numbers. Uh, what it can do is, uh, given your list of numbers, it can remove uh, n is the number of elements here uh, that you're trying to store, uh, log base 2 of n minus 2 bits. Uh, is what can be removed from the number that you're actually trying to sort. Uh, so that's two bits uh, less that are more than optimal. So slightly less than optimal. Uh, basically, it's split into buckets, uh, m buckets, n elements. m and n are roughly the same. And for every bucket in between, you store a bit of one. And for every element inside each bucket, you store a bit of zero. And then uh, you just store the suffixes uh, separate. Just And then, uh, so if you get like uh, zero, zero, then one. In the first bucket, which has a prefix of zero, uh, you know that the first two suffixes have a prefix of zero. And then, so zero, zero, one, zero, the third element would be in the second bucket, so prefix of one, and so on. Uh, oh, I'm going to this. Oh, this is an example. Uh, basically, uh, in decimal, in binary, uh, the formula for figuring out the uh, number of suffix bits, uh, I think it was on the previous one? Yeah. So. Uh, So number of suffix bits is two. Uh, the first, oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in the first one, uh, okay, so uh, this is the prefix, uh, and these are the buckets. So you just put them all into their 
or buckets, that you don't have to store the prefixes anymore. So we remove those. Then I was just adding in the blue numbers are the uh, the control bits. I don't actually know what they're called. I never finished reading the paper. <laughs> Anyways, um, so you then have those, which then you just separate the two. So this is how it would be encoded. The space is just there for emphasis. Uh, so minimal perfect hash functions. As I was saying, uh, press hash and displace. Uh, there is one parameter that we're going to actually look at, lambda. Uh, this is number of entries per bucket. So uh, what happens is you have uh, a normal uh, number for this is like three or four. So you have n elements, m buckets, and then you just do like a modulus to put them all into uh, the buckets. Then you sort the buckets such that you can process the largest bucket first. Then you have n little tiny bins, one for each element. Then uh, you take all the elements in the first bucket. Then you have a hash function that randomly dis uh, distributes them. So basically like another modulus maybe times like a number or something. Doesn't really matter. So it maps them all into these little bins and you try different hashing out uh, hash functions until you have no collisions in there. Uh, this was proven in a paper to run in linear time with a large constant. Uh, then each of the buckets in the original order that they were in, you store those hash number, uh, the hash functions uh, ID, basically like how many you had to try in uh, Fredrickson Nicotin uh, encoding. Uh, basically, it's Elias Fano encoded bit offsets into. So, uh, basically, so each of these uh, bucket numbers are uh, uh, encoded as the bottom line. So, if it's the first. If uh, the first hash, out, uh, hash function that you tried uh, worked, you would store actually nothing. Then if it was the first one, then you would store a single bit of zero. Uh, if it was the second one, you a single bit of one. Then to know, uh, basically, you have pointers into that data stream and, well, offsets. And uh, basically, you store the offsets. Since they're a sorted list of numbers, you can store that as Elias Fano, which is yeah, very effective method of doing that. Uh, lossy hash tables. So one method is to use a minimal perfect hash function. So we index, oh, uh, first you have to split it up into uh, uh, large baskets. Any of other names, because there's bins. And but, anyway, so you have this large basket. Uh, the basket, once it's encoded, is not going to be more than 64K. So the reason why we do this is, one, we can run them in parallel, and two, uh, the minimal perfect cache function needs all the entries in memory, which is several terabytes if, you know, when you scale up. Uh, then we store a password range. So instead of storing like a human-readable password, uh, we basically uh, generate a number that represents that. Then instead of storing this large number, we store like a couple bits representing a range of passwords. Um, uh, worst case is two times the uh, average case. Basically, you're given, when you do a lookup in this table, uh, it gives you one password range that so you need to brute force. So average case is you find it by halfway through, worst case is you find it at the end. Uh, the other algorithm is Elias uh, <coughs> Fano encoding. Uh, same thing, we split it into buckets, or baskets, uh, except for these are going to be uh, smaller. G 
just so that the uh, lookup is uh, faster and you don't have to read as much data from disk. So we only index part of the hash. Basically, we just truncate to um, less than log base two of number of elements in there in the full table. Then uh, basically the suffix bits are zero. So uh, and that's encoded in LA Spano. Uh, then same thing, we store password range. And then worst case for this is four to eight times the average case. Basically, uh, for Elias Spano, each one of the uh, the tiny little bins, the ones that are separated by a bit of one, each bin will have no more than 15, and you can do a binary search in there, so you're only going to hit at most four of them. Uh, so on the plane here, I was reading the uh, paper that describes this. Uh, there's like a five-page intro describing the problem, and during that, I actually came up with a more efficient way for this specific thing. Basically, uh, this is an inefficient way of using Elias Spano. Uh, the number of uh, bins is really small in comparison to how many elements we're shoving in there. So there's going to be, uh, it's, well, for Elias Spano, it's best when they're both the same, roughly. Uh, but when one's really when there's not many buckets, then it's uh, less efficient. So what I thought of was using uh, Hoffman encoding for each of the buckets. Basically, each bucket has or bin sorry uh, each bin um, has a number of elements. So we take that number and then we use. Uh, it's very easy to tell. Uh, figure out the um, uh, so the distribution curve of this is kind of, it goes up a little then it trails off down um, so that we can calculate that curve and figure out the average number of uh, basically the frequency counts for each of those bucket sizes so once we get that then we can do the um, Hoffman encoding, which is a very efficient way of storing numbers once you know the uh, frequency curve, basically. So basically what happens is uh, the average case for using Hoffman tables, or Hoffman encoding, is uh, about the same, basically it's equivalent of a uh, minimal perfect hash function, where the minimal perfect hash function is uh, around 1.88 bits per key. Uh, I guess I forgot to mention this. Uh, minimal perfect hash functions, uh, the one mentioned above, the uh, uh, compressed hash in this place, uh, that's usually around 2.17 bits per key. So it's smaller with the same time. But the uh, worst case is going to be twice as high as uh, the other one. Um, so, uh, lossy hash tables are instant. These are, it's best suited for web services. So, uh, you have an MD5, you go to some website, you give it to them, and then they instantly tell you within you know, a page load, they tell you, oh, not found, or password 123. Um, there's also uh, PDFs, Excel, and Word documents. The old ones, uh, the ones that use RC4 40 bits um, for keys. Uh, with 3.5 terabytes of disk, it would take 55, second, uh, 55 milliseconds to get the encryption key from the file. Uh, this is patented, uh, well, for rainbow tables but it's not really valid. Um, there was a paper in 1980 that literally described this. Uh, the, well, since it was common knowledge, uh, it was actually just like two sentences of, oh yeah, you could also use this for this. Uh, the paper was the Hellman tables, uh, the Hellman paper, I forget exactly what it was called, but um, 
basically, uh, it was describing how to break uh, DES. And then at the near the end, it was saying uh, for stream ciphers, uh, this would also work, uh, which is exactly what this is doing. Uh, why is there an 8 there? Uh, use at your own risk. You could get sued, theoretically. Yeah, the but you probably would. The patents for that are in 30 to 50 countries, I believe. Okay. Yeah, but the, exactly, that's, uh, it should never, never have been granted in the first place. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, basically, it's a uh, exhaustive key search with a known plain text. So, uh, this is a lossy hash table generator or uh, calculator. Uh, basically, you can put in your settings, and then it will tell you, well, at the bottom of it, uh, how long it will take uh, to generate, how long the average and worst uh, average time to actually. Uh, crack a password. Uh, it's on my website. Uh, chain tables. This is your Hellman tables, your distinguished point, rainbow, varying or variable uh, distinguished point, and then combinations of all of those. Uh, <coughs> basically, uh, spoiler, uh, distinguished point tables are uh, less efficient than rainbow tables because the inverse proportion between um, uh, the DP work factor and the success rate. So the DP work factor, uh, the way distinguished points work is you have, so here's your start point, here's the uh, average length of chain that you want, and then you have these two bounds that you can move wherever you want. Uh, if you uh, start constricting it, it takes a lot. Uh, basically, if uh, you generate a chain and it ends before the minimal, then you just throw it away. And if it goes past the uh, maximum, then you throw it away. Uh, basically, as you get closer and closer, uh, the success rate increases. But you want it closer to the average so that when you're using the table, it's faster. So there's this in re inverse relationship to that. Uh, I haven't actually like proved it, but uh, it seems really bad for distinguished points. Uh, I could be wrong, but it doesn't look like it. Uh, but you know, it's hand baby. Yeah, we got a lot of researchers here. <laughs> uh, reduction functions. So there's. A bunch of different methods. Uh, there's divide, which uh, you'd probably know from Rainbow Crack. Uh, the original creator of Rainbow Tables uh, also used divide, but they were doing 32-bit divide in specific cases. Uh, Rainbow Crack uh, basically just uses 64 bits, and it's a very general reduction function. Uh, I <coughs> I rewrote the uh, reduction function to use 32-bit floating point uh, multiply instead of 64-bit divide, and you get a 4x increase on GPUs. Um, this is also done by, well, I'm pretty sure it's also done by the person that wrote Rainbow Crack, but they want closed source since then, or before then, so I actually don't know, uh, but I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Uh, then there's a reduction function based off of 8-bit lookup tables. Uh, basically, this is uh, really fast. Uh, Bit Weasel. Uh, he came up with this. Uh, basically, uh, he was doing this for GPUs. To because doing 64-bit divide on a GPU is really, really slow. So doing an 8-bit lookup into basically a character set, so you got like five A's, five B's, five C's, and so on. My, so a long time ago, well, actually roughly about the same time uh, that Weasel was doing that, I was like, oh, I could do uh, multiply, integer multiply, instead of division. So 
uh, basically what you do is you pretend that your hash or whatever has a decimal point in front of it. Then you multiply it by the um, number of characters in your character set so that the integer value in front of that decimal point is between 0 and character set minus 1. And then you just keep on doing that. But 32-bit uh, multiply, 32-bit uh, floating point multiply, I think is going to be faster. So that's and also uh, divide is more evenly distributed than either of the other two. So and then uh, there's dictionary reduction functions. Uh, there's three that I know of. Uh, there's Matt Weir. He did uh, DR crack. Uh, then there is um, both off crack, off crack. Um, they came up with uh, another dictionary. Basically, it's a dictionary. Well, all of them are dictionaries with uh, mangling rules. And then uh, three rainbow tables, uh, power blade, or, er, right? Yeah, power blade. Uh, Martin. And then there is Markov, which uh, apparently you can actually just do. It, it's uh, basically you have to do random seeking into the uh, Markov model, which I was under the impression that it's extremely slow and therefore you can't really use with rainbow tables. But uh, there was uh, a talk yesterday that was saying that it was fast enough for it. Uh, then there was this other guy that did uh, probabilistic. Um, Markov models. I forget his name. Oh, oh, Simone. Uh, he was the one that did the talk yesterday. But uh, the probabilistic uh, Markov models. Uh, basically, you have this gigantic key space, and you basically have. It's similar to the lookup tables, except for you'll have uh, like ten A's and then three B's and then. 12 C's, and you have multiple of these lookups, lookup tables, depending on the previous character. So your overall success rate for the uh, key space is rather low, but for the simple passwords, the success rate is really high, and for the uh, uncommon passwords, the success rate is basically negligible. So uh, I haven't actually bucked into it that much. But. Uh, start points. Sequential versus random. So I always hear this, and I was in this camp like at the beginning. Um, basically, uh, random start points giving you a better distribution into the uh, better coverage of the key space. Oh, oops. Uh, so first thing, uh, size. Uh, sequential uh, start points. Um, basically, you can you're going to have a number that has a bunch of zeros, at, uh, bits of zero at the beginning, and then uh, your actual start point. Uh, if you have a random start point, it's going to be the size of the key space uh, log n, log base two of the key space number of bits to represent a start point. Uh, duplicate chains. So when you do random, uh, you're going to be wasting cycles on generating uh, chains that have, uh, basically, you generate two random start points, uh, some far apart, and you'll actually, they'll be the same, then you'll generate the exact same chain. Basically, you just wasted generating the other chain. It's not actually that much, but you still waste time on that. Uh, key space coverage. So I haven't seen any papers actually describing the benefits of random for key space coverage. Um, and so what I actually thought of is, so you have a random number generator. Uh, so a good random number generator could be uh, a hash function where you take a 64-bit number Zero. Then you increment it. One, two, three. And you generate those numbers, or hashes, and then you break them up into numbers uh, and use those as your start points. 
Uh, well, you could just, instead of doing zeros, well, this is a better random number generator than, say, uh, other ones like uh, empty rand. So it would give you a better random number than something like that. Uh, then there's, <coughs> if you were just to do sequential, so you'd have like the first password, then the second password, the third password, then you generate the hashes of those. Those hashes would be indistinguishable from the random hashes that you had. So there's, from what I'm, from that, uh, I grab that there's no difference in key space coverage. That's not a real proof, but uh, it's just kind of how um, I, I don't think uh, random is really good and shouldn't be used. Oh. Stop using random sequence. <laughs> I was just going to say, I know of one person that that was relevant for. <laughs> <laughs> Since you guys are using sequential. Yeah. Well, there are still some other people who are just like, oh yeah, random's better. But I don't think it is. I think the... Because it's just smaller. Earlier, I think, uh, there was, we, didn't, we didn't prove it either, but I think earlier we were thinking that if your success rate is... Um, lower, like as your success rate that you're targeting across, that there might be a benefit to random, but well, I'm not sure if... Um, the logical step that that would make is uh, that you don't know what the start points are. Yeah. Uh, you have the same uh, success rate or coverage, you just uh, basically are defining which ones you know are in there. Yeah. Versus being like, oh, it's a random function, pick that random. <coughs> and then you don't actually know which the start points are. So. Uh, perfect first imperfect. Um, so a perfect uh, imperfect rainbow table is one that you just generate, and then you sort, and then the endpoints. Uh, there will be duplicate endpoints. Basically, this is from chains that merge. You could just call this traditional rainbow tables. Yeah. Uh, so, then you have all these uh, endpoints that are the same. Totally lost my train of thought. Oh. Um, so, the problem with these is that they're larger, but they're faster to uh, create. Now, perfect, uh, that's where you remove um, ones that merge. Uh, so let's say two chains merge and have the same endpoint, you just uh, throw away one of them. Uh, you have to generate more chains than the other one, but it re your end product is much better. So step generation, uh, perfect and imperfect. Generation. Uh, basically, step generation, you have this long chain. And so, uh, generating all your uh, chains, uh, so you have all these chains, and then uh, instead of generating all those chains to a certain length, what you do is, so let's say the length is 10,000, you generate all your chains to 3,000, and then you sort and remove duplicates. Then you generate to 60, uh, 6,500, and then you sort and remove uh, duplicates, or duplicate endpoints. Uh, then you finish off to 10,000, and then you sort and remove duplicates. Uh, basically, this is the uh, amount of work done. So if you do it in one step, it's just over 50 times uh, the key space that you have to do to create a 99.9% uh, .9 successful uh, rainbow table with uh, <coughs> four rainbow tables. Uh, for basically everything that I'm doing, it's 99.9 .9 with percent success rate with uh, four tables. I probably should have mentioned that uh, rainbow tables, well, for the people that don't know, rainbow tables are probabilistic. 
meaning that your key space isn't guaranteed, every password in your key space isn't guaranteed to be in your rainbow tables or column tables or whatever, chain tables. Uh, this is specific to rainbow. And then the red line is the limit. Uh, basically, this is where after each link in the chain, you sort and remove duplicates. But that would never be done because uh, the amount of work sorting would be would outweigh the factor. Um, so there are many formats. Uh, the first, basically, uh, best to worst. Uh, Dirt, which isn't done, uh, uses minimal perfect hash functions. So the way that it works for when you use a rainbow table, you generate. Uh, you should explain the, the that name. Minimal. Oh, Dirt. <laughs> destructive index rainbow table. The destructive index is the uh, minimal perfect hash function. Yes. Oh. Um, so when you uh, are looking up, when you're trying to use, uh, crack a hash with a rainbow table, you generate uh, uh, candidates, and then you lock those up into the rainbow table, and then you're given a start point. And then from that start point, you then uh, step through the chain to find the password that you're looking for. Uh, so with minimal perfect hash function, you don't even store the endpoint. You just store the 2.17 bits for the description of the hash function, uh, the minimal perfect hash function. And from that, it will give you a start point. And then from there, you would go on to do that. But since a minimal perfect hash function will always give you a start point, uh, you want to store uh, three bits for perfect, uh, three bits of the hash, so that when you're given those three bits, you check to see if those are the same as the hasher or the candidate that you're trying to look up. Just and if they don't match, then you don't even have to step through the chain. Uh, IRT, ERT. Um, this is index rainbow table. Uh, it uses Elias Fano as the index for the uh, endpoint. So, number of chains that you have in your table, uh, log n of that, minus two, is how many bits you can save uh, from each chain. And then there's IRT2, uh, it's, the I is improved. Uh, prefix index, eight bits. Uh, that's currently the best uh, file format to use because it's the smallest. Then uh, Rainbow Crack, they uh, came up with, uh, I think the C means compress or compact. Uh, basically, they use linear regression on the endpoint to, and then they store uh, the error between, you know, basically, the, the difference between the linear regression line and the actual endpoint. Uh, RTI, uh, that was the first version from uh, freerambotables.com. GRT2 and GRT, uh, those are uh, crypto haze, the weasel. Yeah. Uh, and then the original format, well, the first format that was ever released was RT, which was a very simple one, just 16 bytes per chain. Uh, so now that we know uh, file formats, perfect for uh, perfect versus imperfect, um, we are now going to compare them. So uh, I compared two different key spaces: uh, 95 character, uh, one through seven length, and one through eight, uh, with 10, 20, 50, and 100,000 chain lengths uh, in dirt and or, file format. Uh, generation time between uh, perfect and imperfect. Uh, perfect takes 4.6 times longer, but with step generation that can be decreased uh, to 3.2 for two steps and not 2.8, 2.7. Yeah. Limited is 2.3. So I'm not going to read all of this, 
But uh, basically, well, for size, it varies a little by key space. So those numbers are kind of rough. <laughs> really rough-ish. Uh, but basically, from all of this, uh, the best is uh, perfect rainbow tables in dirt format. And then uh, the worst would be imperfect in IRT format. Uh, dirt is slightly slower than uh, IRT format. Uh, the last two lines. Uh, this is because uh, you're guaranteed to be given a start point, and then there's those couple of bits that tell you that you don't need to uh, even check that chain. <clears throat> All right. So checkpoints. Um, I actually would be running way over if I explain these perfectly. But uh, I haven't really done a whole lot of math with this, like work or whatever. Um, basically, checkpoints. Uh, so you have your chain. Uh, starts here, ends here. Then you have a uh, couple bits for a uh, well, couple positions inside the chain where you get uh, state data. So when you're generating, you go through, and then at this state, you then uh, generate one bit that represents that state. Uh, so let's say the first one's zero. Then the second, when you get to the second uh, position, then you store whatever uh, that state is, let's say one. Then you get to the end, and then you store the chain, you know, uh, start, and end point, and then those two bits. Then when you're um, doing a uh, lockup in the table, you have, so you generate a, uh, uh, candidate that you look up, and then you have these two bits, uh, one and zero. And when you were generating that uh, candidate, you also generated the same bits, or well, the bits at that same positions. Then all you do is you compare those two bits. So if they're the same, so zero and one, uh, can't read. Uh, I, I, I literally. You have 40 minutes left. Okay. <laughs> uh, so if the bits are the same, then uh, you have to check for uh, false alarms. But if they're different, such as one one zero zero one zero, whichever way, whatever, um, then you wouldn't even have to check that chain. So. Uh, the only amount of work that I actually did on this was to see if just one uh, checkpoint in IRT format would be efficient. And uh, I actually thought it wasn't going to be, but it ended up being uh, a better time memory trade-off using one checkpoint bit with uh, IRT format. I haven't actually done uh, dirt format because uh, well, it should change with the chain length to extend. Well, oh, uh, so, so let's say you have 10,000, and the optimal uh, chain length of 10,000, and the optimal point for uh, your uh, checkpoint is at uh, 9,000. I know it's wrong, but let's say it's at 9,000. Um, if your chain length was 100,000, then the optimal point would be at 90,000. Yeah, but not the optimal placement of it, but I would think that as the chain length grows at some point, the uh, utility of the checkpoints for performance is going to increase. Uh, well, okay, so with uh, perfect rainbow tables, uh, the false alarm checking is actually 50% of the pre work, the uh, generating of. Uh, yeah. Candidates. Yeah. And it's pretty much uh, static, the, that percentage, for 99.9 .9 for random tables. Oh, okay. That works. Uh, I think that was everything I wanted to say. Uh, so, 100% rainbow table. Uh, yes, this is patented. Yes, it's valid. But there's a workaround, and yes, it's better. Star. Uh, basically, uh, to get around the patent, 
you would have to do a four, uh, full sort of, uh, basically you'd fill your disk with uh, passwords from the rainbow table. Then from that you would do a full sort of that data. And then you would have a bit field that represents, uh, each bit in that bit field represents a uh, password in the key space. Then you would just uh, set them. You'd read them both in order and set those bits accordingly. Uh, if you don't want to be sued for triple damages, close your ears and check those. <laughs> uh, instead of what they do, which is they put it into buckets, then they read the, uh, they have this bit field, then they have this bucket. They read the home term bucket into memory, and then they read one of the buckets that has all the uh, passwords in it, and then they set randomly those passwords. Um, it's more efficient than doing a full sort of all that data, but <coughs> uh, the part where it's better is uh, you would you would want to store the passwords in a minimal uh, a lossy hash table. Uh, the only algorithm that you'd be able to use is a minimal perfect hash function. If you try to use uh, Elias Fano, uh, that would lose your advantage of doing the binary search. So you'd have to do, worst case would be 15 uh, uh, password ranges that you'd have to brute force. Instead of with minimal perfect hash functions, which would give you one password range that you'd have to brute force, then you just brute force that whole thing and then it would give you your password. Uh, in the patent, uh, they said, oh, just put it into 256 uh, files, basically taking eight bits of the password, or the hash, and then uh, splitting it up into files. And then um, you would just have a list of passwords. So it was actually beneficial to run the rainbow table first, then if you couldn't find it, then you'd run the uh, supplement data. Uh, with using lossy hash tables, since they're so fast, you'd actually run the lossy hash table first because it'd be done in a millisecond, well, oh, two hard drive seeks, basically. Uh, so I have a rainbow table calculator. Uh, basically, you know, key space, success rate, perfect, imperfect, number of tables, and there's a bunch of other settings below, and it'll tell you Two thumbs up. Yeah. Yay for that calculator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I actually use this for the stats comparing uh, imperfect and perfect with those chain links and uh, file formats. Uh, really? I'm like, I think I skipped a lot somehow. Or read really, really fast because this is like my last slide. <laughs> You've got 35 minutes left. I, I know. Um, all right, so perfect helmet tables. Um, so uh, the difference between a helmet table and a rainbow table is, so well, they have the same, so you have your helmet table and your rainbow table. Uh, they have the same chain length. Uh, usually it's n to the one-third. Then, um, the number of chains in a helmet table is roughly on the order of n to the one-third. And for a rainbow table, it's n to the two-thirds, so much longer. Uh, but for a helmet table, you'd have n to the one-third tables versus one rainbow table. So that's where the difference is. Uh, basically, with a perfect rainbow table, a single per, uh, rainbow ta uh, helmet table, uh, every element in that is distinct. So there are no duplicate passwords in any of the uh, helmet tables. Uh, so there is one problem with helmet tables. You can't use uh, minimal perfect hash functions to store them because uh, you, for each table you do uh, chain length lockups and there's n to the one third tables. So and each time you do a lookup, you're given a start point because it's a destructive index. 
So you'd have to store a bunch of bits to state that basically those extra bits would, there'd be a lot of them such that uh, it would pretty much defeat the purpose. Basically those bits are such that uh, you, can, you don't even need to check the uh, chain for uh, <clears throat> false alarms. Uh, so generating these, uh, there was a crypto conference, uh, I think it was August this year. Um, there was this guy that was uh, talking about these, uh, and he was saying how you would use a bloom filter to generate one of these. So what this would do is you have this uh, helmet table, and as you generate chains, you uh, insert those passwords into this uh, bloom filter, and every time you generate another one, you walk up in the bloom filter to see if it's already in the table. Uh, then uh, if it is, then you just throw away the chain. The problem with bloom filters is uh, they're probabilistic. So basically this means that you're going to have a larger uh, start point, maybe by like a bit or so, uh, but it's still, you know, special. Um, so what I came up with was using a cuckoo hash table. Uh, basically it's a hash table data structure that uses uh, the cuckoo uh, collision thing. Uh, so basically what it is is uh, you have two hash functions. Uh, the first hash function, uh, you know, simple modulus or whatever into here. And if it uh, has something there, then you use the second uh, hash function, which is a different map, a random mapping into there. And then if uh, that's also filled, you go back to the first one and you kick out whatever's in there and then you store your data there. Then you grab that one and then you use whatever uh, hash function, the, you use the other hash function to place that where it is, where it should be. And then if there's anything there, then you kick that out, then place that. In. So until you reach an empty one, a cycle, or a threshold. Uh, at that time, you may need to either expand, well, basically recalculate your whole entire uh, uh, hash table. But uh, if you stay below 80%, uh, if your hash table is less than 80% full, uh, the insert time is bound by linear. Or Steve, uh, Steve, you actually have a whiteboard behind you. Oh. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. And they all have pets like that. There's one like on the end there, yes, for sure. There's one right behind the stick. So is uh, everyone actually following or no? Kind of? Actually, this, this came just off of it. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, what? Into it, we chat. Oh! Is that a whiteboard? Yes. <laughs> Steve, I should. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, should I re-explain it? Or? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, well, I, I'm not actually ready for this, so I don't actually know what I'm going to draw. So, here's your uh, um, hash table. Oh, wow, I get colors. Yeah, the, the red either you did very lightly or it's a little, it's a little faint from here, so I assume it's worse from, from back. Good. Okay. That's better. Use black. Use black. Yeah, yeah use the black. Just Ooh. Blue. Blue's good. Oh, that's actually blue, yeah. Uh, blue or black? Blue. 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 Black. Oh. <laughs> blue. <laughs> Okay, so here is your hash table. Um, then uh, let's just 
say these are filled. So um, you're trying to insert a new one. Uh, and let's uh, say this one maps to also here. Uh, this one has there, and this one maps here. So. So those are the uh, secondary ones. Uh, uh, so we're trying to insert another one, and we get here as our first one. So one, and the other mapping is to here. So both of those are filled. So then we let me give these numbers. Sorry. Uh, so this one's filled, so this is our first one. So we kick this out, we'll put it over here, for temporary. Uh, call this, you're inserting four, whoa, there we go. So uh, now we need to insert this one, which the other one is this one, which is full. So we would kick this one out, temporary. <laughs> This here. Uh, so that means this one maps that way now, and this is also that. Sorry. So now we put this in the other uh, bin that it can go into, which is empty. And now we are done with inserting a new one. And as long as there is 20% empty buckets in here, uh, insert time for a single one will be uh, constant time, averaged out. Or basically, if uh, there was a cycle in here, or uh, you hit a threshold or something, then you'd have to resize the hash table. Uh, instead of doing that, uh, I was just like, it seems like a lot of work of programming, so uh, uh, instead of rebuilding the whole thing, just do like a uh, uh, standard template library set and start inserting into that. There's only gonna be like a couple that are even ever gonna get into that, so it's probably not even, yeah. but you, you need to cover those such cases. Um, oh yeah, so the two different um, hash functions for doing this uh, would be, uh, so we have our number x, not necessarily those x's, and we have, uh, basically you do modulus by n, n would be how many elements are in there, uh, then what we would store in one of the, uh, the value that we would store in here would be x divided by n, uh, trucking, uh, plus one bit of zero. Basically, that bit tells us that we use the first uh, hashing algorithm, uh, hash function. So that when uh, you know we're trying to kick something out, like here, we know that, oh, this was uh, the first uh, hash function. So then you can rebuild what the x is from this number and the actual bucket that it is. Then you can do the other hash function. Um, the other hash function would be, uh, hold on. <coughs> Basically, this is like uh, fixed point multiplication. So it would be uh, time. Oh, wait. Uh, we'll call it M. There we go. Right, so M is the size of, well, your, um, your key space. So, uh, M is your key space, so this is going to be like a uh, 48-bit uh, number or something. So 
uh, x is also going to be 48 bit number or whatever your key space is. And is going to be roughly uh, 32 bits. Um, so this is what you would, this gives you the uh, bucket ID number index, whatever. And then uh, what you would store is, oh, right. sorry, truck it. I wasn't prepared for like <laughs> Uh, so you take this number, okay. If you have this in a giant post somewhere, I can look for it. No. Okay. I should though. Uh, it's on these. I don't know, alright. I don't know the actual math, uh, symbol for just the fractional part, but so I'll just do x divided by. Uh, it's weird. I don't know that though. I don't think I've actually ever had to do that except for my TI eighty three. There's uh, f part. Um, so this is just this part right here. So now we're just getting the fractional part, or we're basically getting rid of all the. Uh, Part of it. Then we just uh, multiply by um, and this is what we would actually store uh, in one of those buckets plus a bit of one. So that from this we could then rebuild x using uh, the number stored, the fact that it was the second um, hash function and bucket position. Uh, so, were there any questions on any of that? <laughs> so, sounds like a long lightning talk this evening. Oh. I'm blue. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, uh, I guess that's uh, everything about uh, no blue filters. Uh, one end reduction in uh, size of memory utilization. As you start getting into huge key spaces, uh, it's going to be like terabytes of RAM, which no one really, well, besides, where is he? I know there's someone with like, ah, I forgot your name. You have a computer with like 1.5 terabytes of RAM or something? Yeah. So, I guess he wouldn't need to really reduce the uh, memory utilization as much, but anyways, uh, the way you would do this is whiteboard. So you have uh, your chain length. Uh, so let's say uh, this is n. Uh, I really need to stop reducing letters. <laughs> Uh, you do have 26. 26, that's not a three. variable. Uh, J, let's, let's go with J. I like what kids choose. <laughs> okay, so instead of one F, it's one J. So, uh, well, whatever. I don't want to write a bunch of lines. <coughs> As you can tell, I am not good at writing fast. Uh, so, start and okay. So, uh, each one of these points. This is the, uh, basically you start from the end point and then uh, every j uh, one from there. Uh, this is when you would actually store that password into the uh, Bloom filter or Cuckoo hash table. But at every point in here, you would 
make sure that that password is not already in the uh, the uh, cuckoo hash table or whatever. So what you have to do is you have to check, um, well, I just want to, yeah. Uh, you have to go beyond the endpoint by J minus uh, one. These you just lock up in the bloom filter or cuckoo hash table uh, to make sure, uh, basically the reason why you have to do that is let's say you had a uh, so uh, you had a collision here, but uh, the chain that it collided with stored an endpoint uh, just before, or well, as it could just be there, whatever. Uh, it would store. Uh, this is some other chain in here that you collided with. Now let's say you collided right here. Um, this point right here wouldn't be stored in the uh, loom filter or whatever, but this point would be. So you have to check J minus one to check for uh, collisions that may have happened before there. There are some uh, false positives like if you collided here with something and it was stored somewhere else, uh, you know, like a, this point there was stored, so you collided here and then that was stored, since it's within the J minus one that you have to check for, uh, that would be a false positive, but there are, like, there are very few of these because J uh, is going to be a really small number compared to the uh, chain length. So there's not going to be many false positives. Um, I think that's it. Questions? Questions? You, <coughs> you compare the different format for storing the index only based on disk space, but it seems like stuff like linear regressions is really good for in place, but similar have to modify your documentation to the lookups, while the IRT format, it seems like you have to be compressed in memory, or am I wrong, is there a trick? Oh, that's why, okay. That's why I uh, got through a little quicker. Uh, I forgot to describe how the mini index works. Well, you can go back a few slides. For yeah, it's gonna be like forever. Uh, well, actually, oh, whatever. It's the same type of mini index. I was just going to say, uh, well, this is for lossy hash tables, but the mini index is the same thing for random tables. Uh, so, the way the mini index works is it's a 16 byte value. Uh, there is a 64 bit number, which is an absolute offset. Op offset into it, then there are 16, uh, four 16-bit numbers, which are the sizes of each of those. Basically, uh, the mini-index is, there is, so, so, uh, this is actually four uh, baskets. Is that what I was calling them? Anyways, uh, so the mini index is uh, like uh, um, Q, Q baskets. <laughs> uh, and each one of the values that are stored represents four of those. So there are Q divided by four of these that are stored. Um, so this gives you an absolute position into the file. Uh, depending on which algorithm you're using, uh, it's either going to be um, basically equivalent to a bit offset or a byte offset. Uh, for Elias Spano, um, since you can tell it, uh, it's the and uh, 
So if you know it's in the add element or bucket, I said that wrong. Sorry. Uh, if you know that uh, basically the offset will tell you the how many entries are before it. From that you know, and it will tell you which uh, basket basket it's in. That will tell you exactly where you uh, need to be. Um, then each one of these would tell you uh, how large each one of those uh, baskets are. So you read this 16 byte number, which is 16 byte aligned, which means that you can put that on an SSD and not have to worry about reading multiple sectors uh, because they're 4K sectors. And if you span a 4K sector, you actually have to read both. Um, also, in memory, since it's uh, 16 bytes, that's usually a cache line. So you don't have to span cache lines if you were to load the uh, index into memory. Then from, uh, once you get the exact position into the file, you know exactly how long, uh, how much data you're gonna, the, uh, the basket is with the Elias Pano encoding and uh, endpoint, or start points, and suffixes of the endpoints, and optionally uh, checkpoints. So you just read that from disk, and then you just step through the Elias Pano encoding here. Ooh, big stick time. <laughs> so uh, you know exactly how many bits uh, the uh, you know exactly how many control bits there are. So if you're looking for bucket number, uh, well, uh, if you're looking for the uh, fourth bin, you would just count, count uh, you just seek through here, reading, and you just count three ones, then you would get to uh, there. Then you would also have to count um, how many zeros there were to know uh, inside the um, the array of suffixes and start points, uh, which one that was. Uh, there's an uh, instruction called pop count, which you could use uh, reading the uh, control bits so that it's extremely fast. You can do uh, 64 bits at a time. Uh, was that sufficient? Awesome. And what is the side advantage? Side advantage because you didn't account for it, right? You just told us how much it was to store the compressed indexes, not this mini index. Oh, the uh, Hoffman encoding. Is that weird? No, no, uh, I don't think that. You told us how much space it took to store uh, in the IRB format. That yeah. Does it include this? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, it's the whole entire thing. Uh, you know, the mini index, the uh, LA span encoding, the start points, and the endpoint suffixes. Optionally, checkpoints, but I didn't actually add those. More questions, Steve?